Well, good morning and definitely good evening, wherever you are, because it seems that we have people from everywhere today as well, obviously a lot from Australia, but also from Chile, from Mexico and from the US. We will hear about this. It's crazy times for you guys, but welcome uh, anyhow. So I'd like to ask my two experts to please introduce themselves. Uh, Luik, please, if you could uh, open your microphone and introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you, Belen. Good afternoon, good morning, and, and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Loïc Charmoy. I'm a business development manager uh, for energy storage um, for Vatsila, based, uh, based in Sydney. And I've uh, been working with Vatsila for uh, almost uh, nine years now in, uh, in different positions from, from proposal and business development for um, gas picking plant. Uh, solar PV and uh, and energy storage uh, for the last three years, and uh, yeah, I'm very happy to be to be part of this uh, webinar and uh, very eager to to kick off some good discussions with with all the uh, the attendees. Thank you very much, Luke. Okay, I'd like to ask Luke as well to introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, my name is Luke Whitmer. Um, I'm general manager of data science in the. Uh, energy storage and optimization business unit in Wardzilla. Um, I've been with the company now for uh, five years and we've been um, really busy for a couple of years building some neat technologies and uh, I really look forward to sharing uh, some of that with you guys today. Thank you very much, Luke. And I can see from the chat, I mean, there are people from everywhere. There's a lot of Australians, by all means, but I mean, I'm just gobsmacked by how many Americans, Colombians, Mexicans, and then there's also Singaporeans, Indians. So welcome, everyone. We're going to learn here today about, uh, about battery software systems. Uh, Luke, you're the first one. So can I ask you to uh, prepare your screen and mute yourself. And in the meanwhile, I will just, uh, whilst Luke prepares, I just like to remind you all how this session is going to work. You've probably been in other sessions that we've held. However, uh, I'll repeat it again for those who are new and welcome everyone. We're going to have uh, two presentations, one from Luik and one from Luke, and we will take questions after they're done, okay? For the questions, you can use the Q&A box that is at the bottom of your screens, the one uh, in, the, in the bar at the bottom. Don't use the chat for that. The chat is just for us to have chatting, but in the, in, in the question and answer in the Q&A box, it's really easy for us to follow the questions, so please th send them through that and we will get to them. Um, and also, we are recording this. Uh, it will be available in a, view, in a few days and we will also send along the materials so you can watch them in detail and you'll have also the contact details for both Luke and Luke. So uh, Luke, uh, you can go for it. Uh, we can see your screen perfectly, but yeah, here you go. Well, good. Thank, thank you, Belen, for, for the introduction and, um, and welcome everyone again to this, uh, to this webinar. Um, I'm introductions are already done, so let, let's dive into, into the topic. Uh, first of all, um, I'm going to introduce Vartzilla overall quickly, uh, see who we are, what we do, which, which references we have, before uh, we, we, go, we take a, a deeper look at the, at the Australian market, uh, why it's very specific and, and what can we uh, bring here as solutions. Um, and then Luke will go a bit more specifically into the uh, optimization through the through our gems, which is our EMS, and we'll end that with a with a short demo of of our EMS. So Vatsila, who we are, uh, Vatsila is a is a Finnish company founded in um, eighteen thirty four. So uh, now the, the next the next next milestone is uh, not not less than the 180 years, uh, 90 years, sorry, anniversary. Um, and hopefully we'll be also there for the next 190 years. Um, the order intake is, uh, is roughly uh, above 5 billion euro. Um, good year, bad year, split into um, two, two divisions. The first one being um, the, the marine industry, so providing solutions and equipment uh, for large vessels, um, LNG carriers, uh, container ships, um, among others. And um, the other part of the business, the other half is about energy solutions. So which is the, the focus of, of today's, uh, today's webinar. 
And for energy solutions, we, uh, well, we do have a, a vision which we share across the whole Vartila organization about uh, a future with 100% renewable energy. Um, and everything we do, all, all the solutions we are providing here as well in, in the energy business, in the energy space, is around uh, enabling this transition to 100% renewable energy as fast as possible. So the first part of, of our offering is, is around um, uh, fast starting um, power plant based on uh, reciprocating engines. Uh, whether it's fueled by, by, by gas, by liquid fuel, uh, by biofuel, and even we, we released one uh, pilot with ammonia recently. Um, and the second part of it is um, actually the, what's really the main interest for, for today's webinar is the energy storage and optimization capabilities. So we are a uh, battery storage integrator. And also, since um, Bartila acquired uh, the company Greensmith, uh, US-based company Greensmith three, three years ago, um, also EMS provider, uh, so energy management system, uh, which is delivered with, with our uh, battery storage systems. And for all of these assets, whether it's a, it's a flexible power plant based on, on reciprocating engines or an energy storage plant, we, we do offer also uh, life cycle services, meaning uh, performance and maintenance management over the lifetime of the, of the power plant. So Vartsila, uh, we, we, we are an energy storage integrator, meaning we, uh, we purchase uh, battery modules, we purchase inverters and integrate them uh, we, we, we make the design work and wrap up uh, with the guarantees. So what, what you can see here is um, our um, very standard uh, containerized solution, um, which is then fitted with battery modules inside and, and inverters on the side. Um, one thing which is, which is very important for us is that um, we, are, we are technology agnostic. So in, in terms of battery modules and inverter branding. We are uh, pretty flexible or very flexible even and able to use um, well, any type of, of, of modules, uh, whether it's, uh, uh, we're talking about different chemistries in, in lithium ion, we're talking about different inverter brands. Um, I think that's very, um, that's very important in context of the, of the Australian market. Uh, reason is that um, we, we are all familiar with the um, quite lengthy uh, GPS process, which is often the, the longest, uh, let's say, lead time for, for any um, uh, energy storage and, and renewable development. And um, sometimes asset owners need also to, to uh, decide on, on an inverter platform uh, in order to, to kick off those, those GPS, the, this GPS and, and uh, uh, the GPS preparation and submission. So um, if, if you have some also frame agreements with uh, some of the asset owners and project developers have some frame agreement with inverter manufacturers directly, and we're very happy to, to accommodate um, whatever hardware uh, here and make it work with, uh, with our solution. So then we let's see where where we have deployed actually those those systems, and um, so this is the the reference list for uh, energy storage only, not uh, not not the global Vartsila database or installed based, which is more than seventy gigawatts worldwide. Um, and you see here we have um, referenced uh, or contracted deployed or power plants energy storage power plant in operation. Uh, all over the world with a slightly stronger focus on, on, on the US when it comes to the, the amount of site. Um, the latest reference here is, uh, which we have uh, announced is, is in the UK, also a very, very dynamic market with two times uh, 50 megawatts uh, for, uh, for pivot power. And we are covering with those references uh, very large uh, usage, very large applications, 
uh, well, as large as energy storage can procure, whether it's grid deferral, um, spinning reserve replacement, uh, mic very complex microgrid management, or, or frequency regulation. And what's interesting here is also um, the references in, in the markets which, which share similarities with the Australian market. So among others, um, Aircot or, or PGM in, in the US. Um, these markets are also, um, uh, there are some similarities, some, some differences, of course. Um, and when it comes to the topic today of the webinar is optimizing, optimizing energy storage um, and, and it's optimizing also for, for the merchant markets here. Um, what is similar between Aircot, Casio, uh, and the, the UK grid and the grid here, uh, the, the NEM, um, is that the, the bids are cleared on five minute intervals that um, there are several rounds of, of biddings uh, ahead of dispatch, and that there are some, there's a market for uh, one energy market for, for procurement of, of energy, uh, and one or, one or several uh, frequency regulations market, which, which are cleared um, in terms of with, with power, not, not energy. And also, of course, there are lots of lots of difference here. The type of, of settlement, uh, the amount of of, uh, of FGAS uh, markets uh, where we have here eight in in the Australia, which is which is quite a lot. Um, the the type of uh, penalties, incentives, uh, market uh, cap or spot pricing cap. Um, so that makes it very very interesting to to compare those markets and to share uh, the previous experience we had. In, in other similar uh, merchant markets with what we can have here in, in Australia. So as, as I said, energy market, uh, AEMO, the AEMO market is, is about uh, one en energy on, on one side and, and FCAS on, on the other side. And FCAT, FCAS again uh, split into uh, more re regulation uh, and contingency. Where, where contingency is there to is procured to cover um, larger frequency uh, frequency deviations. Um, what what we can see here, and and uh, you have a view on we have aggregated the um, average energy price for each each market here, whether it's energy regulation or contingency, um, from 2017 to 2019. And what you can see here is, is very specific to the Australian market that that's one of the difference. It's, it's highly dynamic. It's very dynamic, it's moving a lot. So last year's we, um, uh, we saw that most of the, when someone having a battery storage uh, um, asset connected into uh, in the name uh, would have earned most of the revenue through the, the, the reg raise market. Um, and there was a, a, a quite an increase compared to 2019, while contingency raise uh, was uh, a steep, steep decrease uh, compared to, to uh, two years ago. And that would be actually interesting to, to hear uh, in the audience if, if you guys have some, some battery storage connected, if, if you also share the, the, same, the same view here. So it's a highly dynamic market and that's exactly uh, the reason why uh, why you need some um, optimization of it where uh, basically the optimization can also adjust dynamically without that you have to manually you know set up uh, set up your your ems and your bidding system um, what is also very specific here is is that there are lots of rule changes in in australia at the moment uh, or actually rules which were supposed to change, uh, like the five minute settlement and then which uh, have been postponed, um, but also um, changes into the, the primary frequency response. Uh, so the, the mandatory part of it, which will, uh, which have been released uh, like two, two weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago for the final rule and which will then kick in. Um, as such, it, it it will not impact the, the operation of the battery, but it will impact a lot, or it may impact a lot how the other 
assets are behaving. And, and thus it will also, it may also impact how um, uh, AEMO, how much AEMO is procuring of FGAS reg and FGAS contingency. So there are lots of, of moving pieces here. And, and the only advice we, we can have when, when it's so uh, to, to ensure that uh, basically, whether you are an asset owner, financer, equity investor, or, 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 or uh, operator, um, that you have an EMS and, and a bidding system which is flexible enough to cover for all those regulation changes. And also, um, which is not like a, a black box where you, you don't see what's inside and, and you have to live with it. Because if the market is changing, you also be able to understand how to how to change what's how your your plant is is, is bidding, um, and that's uh, one one of the solution or the solution we have um, uh, is called GEMS. So it's the stands for uh, Greensmith Energy Management System. Um, it's uh, it's it's a like software suite with with different layers uh, has been which has been deployed in in all of our uh, energy storage. Uh, power plants, which have been uh, constructed so far. Um, and it has different layers from um, the control of the, of the uh, battery system themselves. So communication with the BMS, ensuring that you have the, the correct warranty conditions that you maintain, you, you don't go out of the, of the uh, warranty frame. Uh, but also if you have a hybrid system, let's say wind, Plus, plus storage or, or solar plus wind plus storage. Also a layer which enable, uh, enables to optimize the full hybrid system and, and the dispatch of every, every single asset within, within this hybrid system. And the, the, the third layer is actually, um, well, the market interface, the bidding part. Uh, which is actually one of the one of the most critical part. Reason is, you can have a, a nice battery storage asset with uh, you know the best technology. Um, if if you don't know how to bid or if you bid it wrong, you're gonna just exhaust the battery, uh, deplete them, and and basically not getting the full the full value for it. Meaning, well, in Australia on, on the merchant market, meaning the full revenue for it. So um, uh, it's the, the EMS part and bidding part is certainly here uh, one of the uh, even most important than, than the hardware and the, than the hardware itself because it, it's a, a smaller part of the project but actually driving the, the larger value of uh, over over the lifetime of the asset and uh, yeah and Luke will drive you drive you through the, the details of this uh, bidding system. Thanks, Loic. Um, let me get my screen shared here. And whilst Luke gets his screen up, just a reminder, Q&A box uh, at the bottom, send your questions. And another reminder, we are recording. We will send you the materials. You ready, Luke? I think so. Do you see my screen? Yes, we do. It says two options. And then Great. it has some. Um, Perfect. Yeah, this is just the next slide from where Loic was going. So, uh, Loic, thank you so much for that um, that kickoff. Um, I'm going to dive right into some of the um, really just a, a candid conversation about auto bidding um, in general, how these types of computing technologies um, can be applied. And um, uh, we know that there are um, options in this space. Um, there's traditional legacy trading houses that um, uh, are engaging in this space. And there's other um, intelligent uh, automated bidding solutions out there on the market as well. And this is um, uh, an area where um, regardless of which technology you pick, we wanted to try to talk about um, uh, our view on the right way to do things, um, just as an educational approach to um, helping each of our potential customers and just the general public who's, who's um, 
uh, aware of these types of systems um, uh, has, has a broader understanding uh, of what it is that is going on in these types of platforms. Um, and so uh, with that, um, there's a lot of analogies that people um, have used. Uh, if we go as far back to, you know, the, when the stock exchange first started getting traded by computers, um, there are some analogies there. It's a little bit different because of all of the regulation and market structure associated with um, energy markets, where pure speed was a really important piece of the financial trading industry. Here, where we are uh, constrained to submitting bids um, every five minutes, uh, fractions of seconds don't really matter. But the timing does still play a part because as you optimize the longer your algorithm can spend optimizing and the more data you can ingest um, that takes actually computationally longer, um, the smarter your algorithm can be. And so uh, the rules associated with the timing of bid placement and gate closure and how you have to optimize uh, as quickly as possible all have to be comprehended inside such a platform. Um, and so, uh, a little bit of background on, on where the GEMS platform has come from. Um, these screenshots on the right are really associated with our um, island grid, full um, grid control economic dispatch platform where we um, are controlling multiple hybrid assets, um, providing a forecasted view of the plan of where uh, the battery state of charge is going to go, of where the um, which engines are gonna turn on and off at what times based on the load profile forecasted um, and those renewable forecasts. Um, and in an auto bidding scenario, um, these types of configurations with multiple different power plants, whether it's hybridized renewables with um, batteries or even larger portfolios that include uh, a retail load curve or uh, some thermal assets as well, um, all of that can be optimized together. Um, and, and so all of that is, is, uh, the, be, is, is uh, plugged into a single algorithm that can determine what's the best way to dispatch my plants. And so one key difference here when we're doing our island control, we're more like the NEM, we're more like the, uh, the system operator where we're uh, focused on levelized cost of energy. Whereas the, the objective function, the problem that you're solving when you're auto bidding is maximizing your profits with your portfolio. And it's the market effect that actually makes the overall market cost uh, less for consumers um, as each power plant owner is trying to make the most money possible. But it's that competition that drives those costs down. Um, so things like incorporating the, the price sensitivity, the pre-dispatch forecast sensitivity into uh, an algorithm is really important because if you can um, have an algorithm that is able to uh, anticipate how much price slippage a certain bid or a certain amount of cleared power will actually have on the grid, um, then your algorithm can be uh, able to understand whether you should be constraining yourself actually in your bids so that you don't undercut the whole market um, too much, but you actually are able to sustain something that is um, still profitable for you as an owner, but it does still actually reduce uh, the price to all the consumers as well. And so um, most of what um, these types of economic dispatch um, problems are, 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 are linear quadratic programming uh, objective functions. And so for um, auto bidding, when there's uh, a lot of good, reliable forecast information, um, this is an approach that works. And this is something that we offer um, as part of our, um, our GEMS platform is uh, advanced uh, algorithms, including things that are directly tied to very traditional linear programming um, module. And so here, this is a, a formal optimization. Um, it requires a very detailed model. So you have to actually capture um, all of the different constraints and costs and create this solution space where the problem uh, is always looking for a minimum. 
um, and you have to leverage uh, uh, solver techniques that don't get stuck in um, local minima, but are actually able to find the global minima um, within the appropriate amount of time. Um, this type of approach enables more control um, and human interactions. Um, there are uh, a lot more knobs and uh, intuitive ways for people to study the inputs, adjust the inputs, and have an impact on what the auto bidding solutions are in real time, requiring less manual bid uh, intervention uh, because you can actually manually adjust some of the inputs separately while the auto bidding process continues. Um, and it can provide a very detailed forecasted view. Um, a second approach is a more traditional machine learning approach, uh, very common um, for this type of problem of uh, decision-making. Do I place a bid? Uh, at this time of day and at what power level should I place it? Um, so reinforcement learning is a, uh, an algorithm that is trained on historic data. So you'd take multiple years of historic data. Uh, you could even adjust those, um, those training data to include uh, expected um, future prices if you wanted. And so uh, that approach, um, it goes through a process called exploration where the algorithm explores all of the solution space and says, well, if I place this kind of bid when the forecasted prices are X, Y, and Z, and when my, my system state, my battery state of charge is, is within this range, uh, what's the outcome over the next couple of hours? And it repeatedly runs simulations of millions of these combinations and explores the whole solution space uh, and determines which actions um, are uh, the most lucrative. So there's a reward anytime the right type of actions are taken. In the case of this type of uh, wholesale market bidding, it's the, the revenue that you earn during that time would be the reward in that problem. Um, and then once there's a, a specific um, a clear path, then the exploitation phase uh, can take place where the model actually runs and exploits that, um, that approach, uh, that statistical uh, best uh, choice in each of these different situations. So that as the battery state of charge is changing and as the market price forecasts are changing, the algorithm dynamically can pick uh, which types of bids it should place in which markets and at what levels. Um, to be able to uh, exploit that and actually make money to ensure that the, the battery state of charge gets positioned at a high um, state of charge before the market um, has high, high price spikes where discharging would be required. Um, so this type of, of approach is a little bit more like a black box. Um, there's, there's not uh, uh, there's not always a clear forecasted view on exactly what's going to happen because this is more statistical um, in, in nature. It's based on um, past uh, experience of, of what was a good thing to happen. And so um, uh, this, this type of algorithm um, is something that, that uh, can be constantly learning, constantly being retrained uh, with different processes to ensure that as those market dynamics change, that that solution space is always um, accounted for. So um, these two different options, um, we as a company have been researching, exploring different methods in these areas now for um, several years um, as we've been preparing um, for the different opportunities um, for batteries. Uh, it's been uh, very clear that that a battery as, as a more expensive asset in a portfolio is central to uh, the dispatch of multiple assets uh, within a portfolio. And so that's really what has led us to the point where um, these types of automated modules are available within the platform uh, to be configured um, for your specific situation, whatever that might look like. Um, so this is, this is a chart that uh, is really useful just to describe what some of the control uh, a human trader person, uh, whether it's, it's someone at an actual trading desk 24 by seven managing multiple assets, or if you're a smaller IPP 
Um, maybe you just have one person who's your trading market focused person and they're not available 24 seven. Um, but during the day they monitor the site review simulations and would um, be able to change settings and let the site just run uh, uh, in auto mode um, most of the time. That, that here, um, just looking at these two charts, let's study the, the top one first. So blue is the battery state of charge and orange is the energy spot price. And so here, uh, a very common knob that we talk about in these auto bidding scenarios um, is the energy throughput cost. So this is a parameter. Um, there's lots of other parameters within the model, depends on uh, all the different configuration for each site. But um, if it's more expensive to use the battery, then the automated logic won't use the battery. It will try to uh, wait for higher price deltas. It will leverage other assets it might have in its portfolio um, to accomplish uh, a certain objective or a requirement. And so here, looking at the blue, um, comparing them between the two, the top chart has a lower throughput cost and the bottom one has a higher one of $30. And so um, you can see that just for example, in this section, the battery state of charge has a lot more activity in the top chart than here. There's a lot of little arbitrage uh, during these, this volatility here that's happening because the battery can exploit more, um, more activity here than it does down here. And so um, you can see that because the, the price uh, of using the battery is higher, that the battery simply isn't used as much. Uh, and in the context of battery warranties, extending battery life, um, in real time, uh, a trader or any type of algorithm that is configured to make the most money uh, will drive the battery into the ground very quickly if you don't have some type of statistical view on how much throughput is your allowance. Are you trying to um, use uh, X number of megawatt hours of throughput uh, this month or this year or this week? Uh, the longer the time range, the better. It lets you have more flexibility. Um, there's an opportunity cost factor here. So you want to use your battery while the market prices are good. And so if there is opportunity, you should capture that um, as quickly as possible. Um, as more batteries uh, come onto the grid, then uh, some of these, this price volatility will be stabilized. And there's an opposing force that as more renewables come online, then the price stability gets worse. And so these, the, the growth of renewables is driving this growth in battery systems that are uh, dynamically participating in these markets for this very reason. Um, and, and having control over what level of sensitivity uh, you want your system to react uh, to the grid with um, is really important as an asset owner to ensure that um, you're able to maximize your returns, not only today, but through the life of the asset. Um, another really important piece um, that is um, often talked about among um, uh, our different engagements and uh, even just various articles uh, studying the existing batteries with the publicly available information that's out there um, is related to uh, forecast accuracy. And this is not just something in Australia, um, but in all of these types of battery optimized, battery centric optimized systems, um, the accuracy of your forecast is really central to uh, achieving good results. Um, and so here, uh, one of the main forecast inputs in any type of Australia uh, automated bidding uh, scenario is the pre-dispatch forecasts that come from uh, IMO. So as those data are coming in, uh, it's rare that a system um, would be relying solely on that information. There's a lot of forecast inaccuracy in those raw datas, um, but at the same time, those datas are uh, really the most, uh, most knowledge-packed uh, 
our, any, anybody's uh, forecasting system is not going to necessarily know more information than what uh, the dispatch operator knows about different plants having maintenance schedules, about potential outages in other places of the grid, um, the congestion that's happening because of the whole grid uh, network and all the interconnections, um, and how power can flow from point A to point B with all of the renewable forecasts across the whole region. Um, and so the, those pre-dispatch forecasts contain the most information, but at the same time, people are dynamically reacting to these forecasts all the time. And so here's just an example where uh, blue is the pre-dispatch forecast and orange is what actually happened. And, and this is very common uh, to see in the data in Australia where in the pre-dispatch forecast, there's some type of big price spike that actually uh, it's, it's showing up here as, as something like a two hour spike from hour 15 to 17. This blue is saying it's gonna be a really high priced couple of hours, but in reality, yes, it did actually spike up that high, but not the whole time. There's a lot of intermittency throughout there. And uh, even, even having this type of, of high orange spike sustained as long as this one did is really rare. That's not very typical. It's more common to have a, a small spike um, or something like that. But the, the, the key piece of the puzzle here is having uh, algorithms and uh, a, a system that is trained in a way to be aware that these pre-dispatch forecasts um, have error, to track that error, to provide visibility to that error to the users, um, and to um, be positioned to, to be flexible and not have uh, such dependence on, uh, not, not expect these to actually happen uh, fully. Um, so just a, an architectural diagram, uh, and this is uh, a generic one that fits uh, all of the different um, system operator interactions that we um, have engaged with globally. So some of the, the US ISOs um, uh, particularly, um, but also it's the same in, in um, Australia where uh, within the system operator, within IMO, there's multiple systems. It's not, it's easy to think of them as one entity. They're the system operator dispatch um, uh, entity. But in reality, um, there's multiple uh, systems that have to be integrated with. And so having a one-stop shop uh, where these orange lines that connect um, uh, our software platform are already uh, established off the shelf um, is really important to enable um, a low risk project. And so here the power plant controller um, communicates with uh, the battery technology or the renewable plants, whatever those types of, of interfaces are. Um, we have standard APIs for communicating with those devices. Um, it's very common for our customers to already have existing renewable assets or existing thermal assets. And so uh, there's some select data that we uh, need to be uh, connected with on each of those power plants um, to uh, ensure that that uh, the system has the data it needs to operate intelligently. Um, there's uh, our connection between, oops, go back. There's our connection between the power plant controller and the cloud. Um, and then our standard API for, for third party um, access and, and inputs. Um, Meanwhile, with the system operator, uh, our cloud is where we're retrieving uh, all the data that's available from there, price data and, and pre-dispatch forecasts. Uh, uh, it's where we um, connect uh, to actually would place bids. Um, and in certain cases, there's a third party between um, us and the operator that, uh, through uh, bid placement entities. That, that place the bid directly for us. Um, specifically, if uh, it's common for our customers to already be using some type of trading partner for settlement services and things like that. And, and that partner may have a technology, uh, a platform already in place for bid placement. And so sometimes there's a connection uh, through a third party on that side for bid placement. And there's cases where we've connected directly um, for bid placement as well. Um, and then after we get cleared, those bids get consumed and uh, 
cleared by the system operator, then any dispatch instructions and uh, for energy markets or ancillary service markets um, get get uh, sent to the power plant controller directly by the system operator, where we would um, clear uh, any types of FCAS contingency types of, of markets. We're clearly detecting our own frequency deviations. Um, and doing frequency response dynamically ourselves, uh, according to the cleared power in those markets, um, while providing feedback uh, in terms of uh, uh, reporting back to the system operator, what's our power limit of um, availability and, and uh, things like that. Um, a really important note is, um, on the fleet director side, by offloading all of the site data to the cloud and providing visibility um, there, there's a, a lot of good um, security. You don't want uh, analysts and market traders logging into your power plant controller. That's not that's not appropriate in modern cybersecurity practices, and so that's that's a really important piece. Um, so being cognizant of time, I'm going to switch to the demo for a few minutes here, uh, and then we'll have at least 10 minutes for questions. Um, let's see here, switch there, OK. So um, I'm going to log into a demo of a 10 megawatt battery uh, in Australia with the auto bid bidding logic running. And we'll be able to poke around and see the clearing um of this simulated environment um you'll get an idea for our platform uh, this is end-to-end -end encryption with two-factor authentication so that you can um, get in safely so i gotta pull out my phone and click that guy let me in this um, is the part where everyone is getting really happy now you know the, the engineers <laughs> you stuck with me this people. long <laughs> I wasn't following the questions. I hope people aren't yelling at me. Start the demo. No, so here we no. go. Um, so just clicking right in here. If you had multiple sites, you do have a nice map view, and you can have uh, different um, uh, virtual power plant operations and logics running between them. Just to let you know, we're only seeing a screen that says demo. OK, so you need you to stop sharing. Oh, yeah, you stop me... sharing because you're sharing the document. You're doing very well. And Thank now you, share Bella. your Chrome. We didn't want to see the password anyway. You know, it's not like we're okay. trying to hack you or anything. I I, I, there I we go. Like, now we can see it. I feel Perfect. like I should log back out, though, so you can see that. <laughs> the login screen's nice. I'll show it at the end if people care. Cool. Um, right, so uh, you get a nice map view. Um, if you had multiple sites, you can see them all in one place, get alerting from all of them. Um, there's just some, some random examples here on the left. Uh, we're mostly focused on, on this site today. Um, if you have virtual power plant logic, you wanna abstract things across multiple sites, um, that can also be managed here. Um, but just so diving into one of these sites, um, this is uh, a very standard um, landing dashboard layout for us. We have a highly customizable interface where any data within our system, you can plot it. Um, uh, it doesn't look like the battery's doing anything right now, which is unfortunate. It was 20 minutes ago, um, but that's fine. Uh, so here, we're just showing effectively what's, what's the site doing. This is just a battery, no renewables co-located. Um, we are tracking all the different prices in each of the markets. Um, uh, the battery state of charge is here. Um, there's some summary statistics on uh, across the top in terms of overall what's the power plant capable of doing right now. So it's a 10 megawatt plant. If one of the, the units uh, gets disconnected or uh, is down for maintenance, then this number would update uh, the automated system. Uh, passes that information along to the auto bidder so that it would immediately adjust those bids due to a site uh, unavailability. Um, as we go down at the bottom of this main page, there's a bunch of cards that represent different groups of devices. So just diving into this one briefly, um, uh, we 
take uh, object-oriented programming very seriously, the relationship between these devices uh, is abstracted um, for that reason. So you can see we've sort of navigated down through the system. So if you wanted to have a specific uh, view on what is available within the GEMS platform, uh, all this data gets streamed off of the, the site so that you can have a very granular view remotely. Um, and if, if we just sort of look at the last five minutes, I mean, th this, is, this is updating in real time, um, all the data that's, that's available from the different devices is visible here. Um, and so some simple things, um, uh, one, of the, one of the, we only have a few high level parameters visible um, today uh, in this public demo. We are, uh, there's a lot of um, proprietary work that we can't share in this public setting. And so we're only sharing some very select things here. Um, but uh, simple stuff just to wrap your head around some of the high level um, things that you can do. Just as an example, the, in the slides, I talked about the battery throughput cost. So if we have been running with a certain battery throughput cost and you've run some simulations uh, with our GEMS Analyzer platform, which is a separate interface, um, and you've decided on some new set of parameters that you want to apply, then you can come in here and you can actually apply those and say, okay, I actually want to run with a higher throughput cost and my battery throughput has been going up. We made a lot of money, but I'm on track to actually use more of my battery throughput than I want to use at this time of the year or whatever. Um, and so you can change that and you can say, well, uh, the other thing I noticed in my simulations was that the energy market um, is causing me to have a lot of throughput um, and uh, it, I'm not actually making as much money in that market as, as some of the other ones. So I want to limit my participation level. I want to really have the algorithm focus on keeping power in the reg market and in the FCAS market. So you can just come in here and say, you know, I only want, I only want two megawatts to ever be bid uh, in the energy market for charging. And I'll, I'll keep my, my discharge here in case there's a big spike. So you can have asymmetric participation in the different markets, but we're gonna force the algorithm to try to charge using the reg market um, more than anything else. So if the SOC is getting low, it's gonna have to do that in a way that actually makes some money. Um, you can save those changes. And uh, when the algorithm gets to the next point in time where it's, it's able to update those bids, then, then those parameters will take effect. Um, uh, and so last couple minutes before we go to Q&A, um, I'll just share in this report section, um, you can look at like last 24 hours. Um, we're pulling in all the different, uh, this one is set up for New South Wales actually. So we're pulling in all of the pre-dispatch um, forecast price information um, live uh, and tracking all the different nine markets here. Uh, you can see there was a, a price spike up to $300 um, earlier today, uh, or I guess what's today? I guess that's yesterday. Yeah, because it's noon in Australia. So this was yesterday evening. Um, and, and the interesting thing is, is when we track different error metrics, the root mean squared error and the bias on these different um, forecasts, we can actually see that um, uh, an hour before uh, this price uh, spike actually happened, there was some error in that forecast. So it was $136 uh, off. It, it, it was not um, accurately forecasted an hour before it actually showed up. Uh, but 10 minutes before it showed up, it was, it was only $65 of, of error. And so um, you can actually have uh, visibility into how good the raw forecasts are coming in. And our algorithm has access to all these different error metrics as well so that uh, we're tracking um, uh, that performance uh, as an input also to the model to ensure that our bids uh, that are being generated um, uh, have that learned knowledge uh, within them as well. So um, I don't think uh, 
there's there's lots more we can show in the demo. Um, but uh, again, in the in the context of this public setting, we want to just keep it a little bit short. And uh, as time uh, is wrapping up, I think we're open for questions now. Thank you very much, Luke. Very nifty tool that you have to go in there. I assume that it learns more. So it's kind of like machine learning style or are you guys changing algorithms at the back or how does it work? <laughs> yeah, great question. So there are aspects of it that, um, that can be set up for self-learning. Uh, a lot of this stuff is pretty new. So while we've been setting up the back end to uh, support that, most of our stuff in production today is pretty hands-on just because of uh, the nature of um, these markets and how we don't want uh, these million dollar assets doing too much on their own yet. We we're keeping pretty close track of them. Uh, an important thing to keep in mind as the world does move more towards uh, more autonomous uh, retrainings and self-learning as time goes on, it is really just tracking performance and having boundaries and alerting and alarm set up, which our platform supports um, fully out of the box in terms of being able to track um, uh, those different performance metrics and getting text alerts and email alerts, however you configure it to um, alert you when different thresholds get crossed so that you can say like, huh, uh, I, I didn't, I, 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 we used to be performing better than that. I'd better go uh, look at it. So that way things don't go on for too long without people paying attention. I, I can imagine like you can go crazy if you're trying to understand, you know, the like in and outs of every single market that has battery storage in the world because they're all so different and you know, the stacking of values is still not clear in different markets. So a lot to come. A lot of work for you guys at Greenfield. I'll read, I'll read some questions to myself. Sure. Loic flagged some for answering. Yeah, he so did. Loic, yeah, you yeah, can, yeah. You can go to, to town on that while I think about what I want to answer next. Okay, excellent. So uh, Loic, you, you've answered a lot, actually. But one of the ones that you have uh, live is when different plants owned by different operators in the same network all are operating on a GEMS platform, are they potentially fighting each other as they're operating on the same bidding algorithms? Yeah, this one is, is a good one. First of all, uh, we are very eager to, to reach this point where several assets are bidding with the GEMS. And, and it is true that um, these assets would actually, if owned by, by different owners, would compete compete with, with each other if, if they're bidding, let's say, two separate uh, uh, storage assets um, bidding on, on the same merchant market and would have uh, like the same algorithm. Then what, what would be different is, of course, that would be an issue if, um, for example, Vartila would have incentives on, on revenue sharing, for example, or incentives to, uh, fav or to, to optimize more one asset versus the other. Um, uh, that, that's a very good one. I think there, there's also, um, to, to provide some confidence here, um, there's also a kind of, of, of manual setup, which is possible to do, which would have an influence on, on the, the, the bidding behavior, as, as Luke explained about the throughput cost. So the systems would not be like 100% similar first. And um, I think it's also um, uh, the confidence we can provide is, is by providing some transparency here. On, on you know how how the, the the plant or how the bidding system is is operating. And maybe Luke, you you have some more more comments on that, which is which is a very very good and a bit tricky question. Yeah, I mean, um, our approach is that our algorithm is not um, ours. We are a uh, we are a, a an optimization machine learning platform. Our technology is. Um, pretty open to our customers once we get inside of an NDA um, uh, and there's uh, you know an active project we're working on something contracted uh, we work very closely with our customers to do what they want to do and so yes in the sense of the fact that the markets are set up for competition yes there's risk of, of batteries driving each other to the bottom but at, in the end each each asset owner is going to have to determine their own thresholds of, of what they're comfortable with um, in terms of the operating profiles of their systems. And it's your asset. So it's not up to the automated logic to 
uh, fight with each other. It's up to you to think what's, what should my strategy be and what kind of things do I want to do? Um, and our platform, it, it gets configured that way. And so sure, we have recommendations, we have lots of simulations and we have, um, a uh, sort of a standard way of doing things. But, uh, in, in the end, uh, the algorithm is going to be different enough on each project and with the different geographic reality of the electric grid. Um, it's never going to be to a point where we would get, you know, dispatched in such a way as to, um, you know, really collapse the whole market unless there was so many batteries on the grid to get there. And at that point, I think that the, the grid will be set up in a way to actually manage that better. Um, so that case may have to change. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, another one for Luik that you had uh, marked. Just wanted to know if GEMS can be appropriately configured to take weather forecast data for renewable energy assets and energy market day ahead of real time. Live historical data to predict the demand and place bid automatically suggest bid values to the project owners, which you can. We just... Yeah, so that was a pretty long question. So I thought better to take it live. Um, we, we do have uh, systems, um, especially uh, microgrids, where we integrate lots of, of forecasts uh, into our, our dispatching um, algorithm, whether it's a renewable forecast, so a day ahead um, or, or short term uh, um, forecast for wind, uh, for, for solar, we can integrate as well, but also load forecast, so that um, also all these forecasts will be incorporated to the algorithm to better to have a better uh, state of, of charge management, and um, so short short answer is is yes, and I think it's it's also when we talk about um, uh, hybrid power plants, uh, renewable plus storage, it, it's one of the of the key of optimizing here the the whole system, not only each part individually, but the whole hybrid system and the dispatch of, of the whole unit. Perfect. And I'm going to do one more for you because you marked it. And then, look, you can take it on from if you want to answer a few. Okay. Can you use GEMS on on-site other battery management systems? Uh, and what level of interface will be required with existing battery controllers, power generation, and customer loads? Yes. Um, that, that's a good one about the, the interface. And it's, it's related to the, the kind of first layer of control of, of GEMS on how to control the, the battery modules themselves, the battery rack. So on the top of, it, of each battery rack, we have um, a BMS, which is supplied by, by the module manufacturer. So we, we don't uh, manufacture our own BMS. And, and here we ensure that there is a proper communication uh, between the, the, our energy management system, the overall architecture, and the BMS on, on the top of, of each rack. Um, how the interface, like the technical details on, on the interface, I leave that to look about if, if we're uh, talking about uh, what type of, you know, signals or communication protocols. Um, sorry, I was reading questions. Was that a question to me? Yeah, uh, more, more about the, the communication about the, the EMS and the BMS, uh, what type of um, uh, communication protocols or, or um, because we yeah, integrate yeah, yeah. BMS from from you know from battery modules manufacturers. Yeah, I mean so, most uh, most BMSs speak CAN bus or Modbus. Um, we have our own fully integrated turnkey battery systems, which is what this platform uh, comes with. But so uh, you, if you have some type of separate power plant controller, um, you have to have a battery uh, interface with that. That's that's pre-integrated, right? So. Uh, it's, it's quite separate from the market bidding side of things. Um, Go ahead with your questions. I know you have a few. Sure. Yeah. So I was just reading a few here. In general, let me try to bucket a couple of them as we wrap up. A um, uh, question about renewable energy, um, co you know, uh, being able to co optimize between that and, and st storage. If there's like a solar plus storage PPA, how does that, that work? Um, uh, all of that really comes down to the commercial side of how you, who's your off taker and what type of flexibility do you have inside of that PPA to participate in um, open markets? Um, is your interconnection big enough to support um, actually when you register with the grid, 
in Australia, your renewable plant is registered separately from your battery anyway, but you might have some type of um, transformer or interconnection constraint that you'll have to manage. So yes, GEMS manages all of those complexities for a specific site. Um, and then uh, some other questions here. Um, specific to um, some of the stuff we were showing, uh, Adrian's got some questions uh, here related to the throughput cost, having it as a function of something else like SOC um, so that it's dynamically getting it adjusted. Um, uh, it's a very interesting idea uh, that it turns some things into uh, nonlinear, um, not, there's some nonlinearities when you start doing that. And also uh, you, you would end up in some situations potentially where uh, the algorithm would, would not do the things you wanted it to do. Uh, I think it's an interesting idea um, that, that I haven't thought about too much. Um, and there may be some reason to apply uh, that throughput as a function of something other than SOC um, directly, because once you get a low SOC, I mean, you're going to want to charge back up and it's, you've already done that discharge. Uh, uh, just to have it increasing as you go down, it's a little bit too late to change those, those bids. Um, you really want to have accurate forecasts and a plan for the day that's going to maximize your revenue because for the most part, you're a price taker. Um, you do have some impact on the prices, especially if you're a big battery or if you're in, you know, South Australia, then you're a little bit more of a price setter. Um, but in general, you, you want to plan out what you're going to do that day and stick to it. And so it, the, the throughput cost is a bit more of a longer term thing than something you'd want to change um, throughout that algorithm. Um, question is the demo working on actual, uh, live data from, from NEM? Um, yes, it's not. And then we are self clearing ourselves. So we are not, uh, not the NEM, not, not the, the NEM D dispatch engine. No. So we're not actually integrated to that dispatch engine, uh, which is being asked. So we're simulating the clearing ourselves, uh, in this demo. Uh, but, um, in the context of a specific project, uh, then that type of simulation can, can be performed. Um, any other questions stood out to you guys? Bailin, I'm Luke? thinking one for, for um, energy storage. Can this tool be used for uh, energy storage sizing optimization, not, yeah. not operation? Um, yeah. which, which is a very good one, actually, because well, it's it's the same um, the same background algorithm which is running not for the same purpose, and and we do have a function. If you um, uh, when when you're having a, a second look at the slides uh, in the gems presentation, there is one one module called analyzer. Is what we use also in order to um, design a system and and especially a hybrid system. So let's say um, if you have you want to have 50 megawatt firm capacity. Of, of, uh, of renewable, what size of, of what size of solar, what size of storage uh, would you be able to install? It's it's an analysis which uh, which we do internally. Um, is kind of complex. It it also takes time, so we we, we don't uh, generally do do that uh, widely open. Uh, but on project by project basis, this is also something which we can have a look at. Yeah, I'll, I'll just there's another question kind of related here. Can your tool perform, this is from Dueno, um, can your tool perform a forecast of IRR for a potential storage project? So yeah. as Louis said, we do have capability in-house of simulating and, and helping uh, size and maximize IRR in specific combinations. Um, it's not something that, you know, if you buy the tool or buy a license to the tool that you can do yourself, it's something that, you know, our data science team will support uh, very few selected key uh, pro projects that are uh, really on track to closing. You know, we, we're not in the business of helping you figure out your business case, really. But I think in terms of uh, narrowing in on things and uh, finalizing system design, uh, that's really what we leverage that tool for. 
Okay, well, thank you very much, Luke and Luke. Uh, thank you very much for sharing with us today uh, and show that mobile. I think that's what everyone likes to see. And thank you very much for our audience. Don't forget, you can get in touch with both of them, you know, in their materials, their information is there and uh, you'll receive it uh, by the end of the week. So thank you very much again, everyone. Thank you very much, Luke and Luke. And thank you very much, thank everyone in the audience and see you next time. Yeah, thank you. See you and don't hesitate to contact us uh, for all the unanswered questions.